Anna Ruler. I'm a sports performance coach. Um, I have my CSCS, which is my certified strength and conditioning specialist, and I'm a certified exercise physiologist. So when I say sports performance coach, everything under that umbrella is I'm a sprint speed specialist. I was on the University of Regina track team, um, as well as the soccer team. I got to participate in Olympic trials for um, the 100 meter and 200 meter for two trials in a row. So I was in track and field for almost around 10 years. Um, I'm on Team Saskatchewan Olympic lifting and I'm actually the record holder for snatch and clean and jerk within my province um, in the 55 kilogram weight class. That's just a picture of me lifting weights right there at nationals. I played on Team Canada Football Worlds in the 2017. So that's just a picture of me down there. So I actually played um, corner for that. And I actually played in the Legends Football League in the States. I played running back. So lots of speed and power sports for me. I was actually on Team Canada bobsled and skeleton once I graduated university. So another speed and power sport, um, which was so much fun to participate in. And um, I had a really good time. Oh, um, university track and field athlete. I kind of mentioned that as well. I was actually the first female to be on the University of Regina Rams um, football staff as their sprint speed specialist. So I worked with the different groups about their sprint speed, their, their agility, um, what we can do to strengthen these athletes overall to make them better, better contenders for the season coming up. And um, now I'm, because of the pandemic, I had to kind of dial back and I was on my own quite a bit but because of that I got to work with tons of CFL athletes getting ready for the season I'm so excited they announced it coming up so I've kind of done um, private contracting for CFL athletes I still work with tons of Rams athletes um, in Regina here I do online training as well I work with Rugby Canada um, I work with uh, hockey athletes as well and the, S the SAS Junior Hockey League athletes everything that encompasses speed and power. And I also teach Olympic lifting. So I got all of that under my umbrella and I was a little bit of sports broadcasting as I did some for the riders. I was their in-game host for 2017 and lacrosse. I also coach um, lacrosse, lacrosse speed training and I'm the Saskatchewan Rush in-game host. So that's a lot of stuff. So my goal for today is to actually give you guys more of um an opportunity to put more of these drills into your tool belt to help your athletes get faster and more explosive and look at sprinting from a technical background standpoint and look at what I look at for my football athletes to help with their field sport and their skill. Okay, so our determinants of speed, how do we get our athletes faster? Well, it comes down to all these things that fall under the umbrella is our stride length and stride frequency. And everything under there is our body mass, leg stiffness, mobility, sprint drills, nutrition, plyometrics. And I'm gonna touch on some of those today. So the three things that I kind of look for when I look for proper sprinting is posture, mechanics, and rhythm. And I'll go over that today. So I wanted to go over the first thing is our speed and tempo session warm ups, And this is the very first thing we need to do. And once I started coaching a little bit more football with athletes, and I, I helped out at a lot of local camps and um, helped out with local teams like the Regina Riot, I found that there wasn't a great warm up in practice. And even working media for the riders, I had to go to their practices. And just watching, even at the CFL level, I saw there wasn't a great warm up presence. And this is what I'm going to put for, forward with a science background, showing you a really good warm up that's put together for those speed and tempo days that's going to have your athletes warm and ready to go and use the muscles um, that they need to require to prevent them from injuries as well. Because we hit hamstrings, we hit everything, we hit mobility in this warm up. So let's go over it. I even have it labeled here. So skipping arm circles. I like to start from the feet up. So this is just activating everything from the feet to the shoulders that's involved in sprinting. I kind of do a nice jog back and you can go more than 10 yards here, but I just kind of kept it to 10 yards for um, purposes of this video. Backwards arm circles, that's gonna hit hamstrings as well. And see how I'm just picking up the leg and I'm really driving that leg backwards. Skipping arm raises as well. Very healthy to get the shoulders involved with this because they are sprinting and should be bringing those arms out really big. So we'll talk about that. 
skipping sideways, getting a little shuffle in there. And this is everything we're doing is we're upping the tempo as we go while I work with these athletes and just having really good mobility as we go forth here. Okay, so easy acceleration, which is just a sprint. And when I give these accelerations is I give a percentage. So you saw back there, I gave 80%. So we're just getting warmed up, right? We don't want our athletes to get it. So that's kind of a slower sprint for me, just getting really warmed up. Our butt kickers, obviously really good to help our athletes not overstride because that can cause a lot of injuries if we start pulling the track or the turf. And then I actually hit uh, a backwards. So this is a backwards butt kicker, which is amazing because it's going to keep your hips under you. Let's go back to there. Do, do, do. Backwards butt kickers. It's going to keep your, yeah, so right there. This is going to hit the hamstrings even, even more. And I'm very, very conscious when I warm up the hamstrings for these athletes because we don't want any injuries. Crossovers, a little karaoke to get that mobility. And everybody knows that one. Just getting a little jog back. Going the other side. All right. Then I up the acceleration level. And then I say at 90% of your maximal efforts, so let's do another sprint. Now we're getting a little bit more mobility in there. And this is really good for form and function, right? Really bringing that adductor and addu adduction and abduction, bringing those legs back and forth and back and forth, opening up those hips. I hear way too many hip injuries with my athletes. This is so simple. Any, uh, anyone can do this. I just do one times 10 each side. Okay, I'll fast forward that a little bit. Then we go to the side. We bring the leg up and we get a nice hamstring curl in the back. And this is gonna help our athletes and prevent them from overstriding as well. So that's why I added this into our warm up exercise. One times 10 each side. Okay, then I make a do another easy acceleration, 95%. So we're upping it even more. So then we got our high knee drill, which is just kind of like your running A's into a softer start acceleration. So now we're kind of upping the level. We got our butt kickers for five yards. And then we got another acceleration for a little bit longer. So we're upping the intensity of our warm ups to get really, really ready for our sprinting. Side shuffle for five yards into an acceleration. And when I say acceleration for these ones, they're still gonna be 95% as we're upping the level. And then we do our build up runs. So we start this sprint 70%, 80%, 90, 95 as we're coming coming out of that warm up and into the main workload for the day. And that's what we have for our warm up. So the next section I have is our, our speed session drills. So everybody knows what high knees are, right? So they're called in the sprinting world, marching A's or skipping A's. So the first one I do form and function. I say athletes, we're gonna get form and function. I want those arms 90, 90, cause we are walking. So even if they are football athletes, I say get those Get those arms 90, 90, because we're really gonna work on that form and function before we start going. I know during the sprint, they won't have their arms 90, 90 the entire time. And I will touch on that. We want the knee up. So I have the three bucket effect. I pretend there's a bucket of water on our head. So we're super tall, a bucket of water on our knee. So we're not gonna tip that bucket. And I'm almost carrying a bucket of water in our hand. So we're not gonna tip that bucket over. And when I say 90, 90, I say chip to dip. So we're pretending we're holding a potato chip because it's coming up to our mouth. And we don't wanna crush that chip because it's gonna put too much tension in our shoulders. And then we'll get a limited range of motion with our arm drive, nice soft chip. And we got the dip in the back. So put the chip in the dip. And that really helps with athletes kind of, yeah, everyone likes chips. And then I, I joke, I say, what's your favorite chip? So that kind of helps us get that movement down. And I see way too many people bringing that knee up too high and that's over rotating the athlete's trunk and core. And of course, toe, toe dorsiflexion, right? I'm getting that toe up, which is gonna drive that heel to that hamstring. See, I got a nice little Z there. I don't want the foot coming all the way, all, the knee coming out and the foot coming out, so it's making an L. I want a nice Z under your butt there. So those are some things to look for for your athletes when they're doing these drills. And you will notice, when I'm working with football athletes, I don't make them do the, the running, uh, skipping B or running B because with the football athletes, they seem to 
lean back way too much and over rotate. So with the B, you're coming out more and you're pulling the turf and you're pulling the track. I actually stay within the A group for my football athletes. So we'll do our A mocks, our um, marching, our walking, and then our running A's, which are our high knees. And you guys all know these ones. So I'm just keeping my form and function, form and function, form and function. Okay. So now we're warm. So there's another way to manipulate these drills. So if you're really, really good at that, doing that already, you can get a partner just to add a little resistance on your athlete because you have to um, come up harder. You have to come up stronger. You have to put a little bit more force and uh, apply more force to the ground to do this activity. So this is, this is one way to manipulate that. And I have one more way to manipulate the other one. So when I put the band around my waist, it's going to show your athlete where your waist is um, in space and time, because some athletes hinge at the hip, they start going forward or too far backwards. I love having that band on because it's going to keep me up it up tall, nice and nice and straight. And I have to push, I have to push forward. So this is a great way to manipulate that exercise. Once again, if you've moved past just the walking and the marching and the skipping A's, and you're really good at them, here's a great way to do this. Okay. So the next part of our warm up, and I actually do this for a lot of my, I have a couple guys that were getting ready for the combine. I noticed their arm drive for, was just not very good. So I incorporated these arm drills into our warm ups, and I saw such a great benefit with their arm drive right off the bat because they were getting ready for their 40, right? And they were getting ready to sprint fast. If you guys are sprinting fast, here's a couple arm drills and reaction time you can do. As a coach, you can stand behind your athlete. You can clap and just explode those arms out, right? We're working on those fast twitch fibers, explode those arms out, just be behind them. Do a couple of those after your warm up, and you're ready to go. You can even do a little arm separation with extension. Kind of slowing it down so we can watch it and see how I'd react off of him. And then even you can do one clap for eight reps here. So I'll do eight in a row. So this is gonna be very key and crucial for guys to kind of get that and expand that arm drive, get them better sprinters. So I'm gonna break down what a sprint is. And I like to break it down for my athletes in two forms. And I've come across way too many football athletes that are just going through the motions. I say, how do we break down this 40? How do we actually get you faster? Is we break down your sprint into segments. So we can look at acceleration and then maximal velocity. So for our acceleration phase, we'll talk more about that. Then we'll talk about maximal velocity. We're gonna have that grady, uh, greater body lean, longer ground contact time, shorter flight phase. Um, greater knee extension. So let's look at acceleration. This is what one of my athletes first taking off from his sprint. He's got that little almost lean forward. And I don't like to say get low for my athletes because a lot of the time they hinge at the hip. I just like to say, get that nice angle, get that lean when you're coming out and we'll explode from there. So it's for a football athletes, it's the first eight to 10 yards of the sprint because they're often running at maximal, like the 40 yard. So we get that forward posture, increase vertical and stride length for this one. So you just want to get like a big start out there, push down and back before we get up nice and tall. And they increase, uh, decrease ground contact time, increase flight phase. So we want to get full range of motion and apply force the entire time for this. So what I like to say is be the hashtag because I often take videos of my athletes and we try to line up. Are you leaning? Is anything out of whack here? So we see the body being nice, this nice line here. I love it. Um, we want the arm coming up right in front of us, right in front of our face. We want that knee drive punching in the air. Sometimes um, just a, a shallow knee drive can be the determinant of a faster or slower athlete. And that's what I've come across in my findings. So improving our arm mechanics, early acceleration, right? We're going to bring that one arm up. We want the second arm coming back nice and flex, not all the way totally back, but nice and flex when you're pushing off the ground and working on that get off. Strong posture and that nice line. So do this, push hard down and back. Don't be that rounded athlete, which I see a lot of my receivers doing. So we work on posture and position all the time. So I wanna talk about different ways we can kind of incorporate starts with our athletes. So there's two starts we're gonna talk about, soft starts, and hard starts. 
with our soft starts, it's a better way to help our athletes not put so much energy into a start and kind of leave our quality starts a little bit later. So you can actually warm up with more softer starts and get, get your blood flowing and you're not going to put too much pressure on your central nervous system, your CNS. So our soft starts, and I'll give you some examples of those, are smooth starts from higher set positions, right? Um, movement added to the start, like falling starts, less energy and tension required, and they're going to be so much better on your joints. Um, less foot, ankle, and Achilles calf stress. So typical distance is like 10 to 40 yards for this. Falling starts, walk-in starts, flying starts for your athletes. So I have some video here of different starts I, I used with my athletes. There we go. So this one here is a staggered falling start. I actually commanded my athlete, we'll listen here, because I said fall and then fall and go. So that's one of my, there we go. Okay, the second one here is our tall and fall start. So I'm gonna bring my knee up and I'm already in the falling action. This one's gonna work a lot of trunk for those athletes, right? Um, so this is why I really appreciate the tall and fall one, and it's um, less detrimental detrimental on the joints, okay? And really pushing off there. Falling starts, now we can have an even set position for those people that are starting off in a more even set, getting just up a little heel raised and falling until we can't handle it anymore, right? Because I'm still coming out, pushing out, pushing out. I'm still getting that leaning form right there. I'm still getting that optimal knee drive. And you will see a lot of athletes cave in this position and then you can see where their weaknesses lie. And this is why I love testing my athletes with tall and falls or falling starts. All right, okay, so here's some good starts for your athletes and they might look pretty simple. And I, I thought maybe you'd think these are simple, but change of direction. So we got backwards laying starts. I have to plant and I have to go. So that's super, super important for some of these athletes that need to plant and just work on their get off from there and sprinting out of that position. So staggered falling sled starts as well. With the sled, I only put on 10% of my personal body weight. So I always ask your, my athlete, what is their body weight? And I just put on 10% of that because we wanna still be super fast. And I thought maybe that little nugget of information could help you guys a little bit more when you're planning sled pulls because the more weight we put on, the more it's just gonna destroy that form. So I like my staggered fall, falling sled starts with a 10% of my body weight. And I also love the sleds that have um, more of the vests up here because it's not gonna pull, I hate the ones that have at the waist because then my athletes tend to hinge at the hips and come down. So if you guys are looking for equipment, I would get ones that uh, go around the shoulders. Okay, so those are some examples of our soft starts and you guys can incorporate in your practice to kind of start off maybe some of the practice. You guys can even do like five times 10 falling starts. Okay, so we're gonna look at our hard starts. So explosive starts from stationary positions. A lot of energy required for these, greater knee flexion at start, greater foot and ankle, Achilles stress, um, typically 10 to 20 yards. So this is an example of our block starts, push-up starts, three-point starts, and medicine ball starts. So as you guys know, the, the most um, one that's looked at the most is our three-point start. So how I set up a three-point start, I'll just go over it really quick. And I do this for my combine athletes because I have to get them ready for the combine. How can we set up a very good three-point start that you're going to start and you're going to be down low and keep driving for the amount of the 10 yards that you need to do to be fast overall? So I look at hips, head, and hands. So I actually do one of my personal feet away. If you're taller, maybe one and a half feet. And the second one is two feet away for me. I am five feet, so if that gives you a little direction. Taller athlete, two and a half feet. So that's where I put my feet. I put my hand on the line right down there. I put my other hand just in front just to give me a little bit of uh, guidance there. I kind of put my head down because way too many athletes are looking where they're going and we want to bring our head down to create a better shin angle when we push off. I'm gonna come up, raise those hips a little bit, bring that hand right by my side. It's not gonna be fully up in the air. I'm straight over the line as you guys see right there. So that's gonna give me more momentum going forward. I'm gonna push off, change that shin angle, change that shin angle and go. 
And look at, look at, look at that low heel recovery. And that's exactly what we want to see for a three point start. So some of our hard starts, again, we can do a four point start if you guys want, which is just four points of contact. You can do staggered start, which is a two point of contact. So I say guys, two point starts, which is super easy here. Just one foot in front. I want the athlete to get low because sometimes their back leg is super straight and you have to look for that. If that's the case, they're going to stand right up. So we have to look at that knee. We have to shift that shin angle down, drop it and go. As soon as I drop, drop, drop here, I change that knee is pointing downwards and I'm up and I'm off, right? I'm getting that triple extension, which is extension at the ankle, at the knee here and at the hip. And I'm already gone. I'm already gone. This is a great start here. Good. Okay. This is um, one of my uh, D linemen. We're actually doing a kneeling start for him because he's working on his get off. And when I was watching him sprint, he wasn't able to get down and he's a little bit older of an athlete. Yeah, he wasn't able to get down as low as he would like. So we actually brought him down to kneeling starts, which is just on the ground here. Because you see here, he's able to challenge that ankle a lot more and shift that shin right, right there as soon as he pushes off, which is a, that's perfect right there. So we're seeing him achieve that by doing some kneeling starts. And I would encourage you guys to kind of put that into your programming as well. Push up starts. This is going to challenge that trunk position once more. You could do a segmented push up start. So I like to even call a uh, push up. And then I say knee, bringing one knee up and holding it to challenge that first start and pushing off from there. And we got our sled pull starts without doing a little fall into it, just a hard push out. And then we got our med ball to throw, uh, med ball throw to sprint. So we'll push off with that med ball, working on that get off as well and sprinting out after it. So it's gonna work on that um, ground contact time and making that a little bit less. So we got our med ball side throw to sprint for change of direction. We're changing direction, throwing and sprinting. All right, so we got our resisted sprint. So it helps out with our nervous system recruit even more muscle fibers. So how I set this up is I'll do a resisted sprint with my athlete first. Then we do our regular sprint second because it's gonna be that post-activation potentiation. And I know that's a big word, but we're actually recruiting more motor neurons by giving a little bit of like resisted movement and sprinting here um, to get us faster for our second workload. And we'll actually get faster for our sprints right after that. So after we do the resisted sprints, wait about three minutes, then we get into our regular sprints. So right here, I have two types of resisted sprints. The first one here, um, my coach is holding me back. He's resisting for about five yards or five meters. Then he lets go and I have an accelerated effect. The next one here is I find a lot of athletes um, are not balanced when they're getting into a three point or a two point position. Here's a great way to fix that. So you can use a band, you can use a, whatever you want for this one. I'm gonna get set up in that position and I actually have to push, my, my coach is going to hold the tension. I have to push out against him to, to even go. So he's going to hold, hold, hold the tension. And I'm just going to snap and go. So that's really huge for any of those athletes that really need to work with those get-offs. Um, and when I see athletes are struggling with just their 10 meter and their 40, um, I actually make them do this the most because we need to work on more closed chain exercises if they are struggling with their 10 meter or 10 yard. So maximal velocity, our second part of the sprint, we were down, we were leaning for that eight to 10 yards there. Now we are transitioning up into that upright posture. And you can see my athlete, we were um, timing a little bit here. He's getting that upright posture where he's fully, he's coming upright. He is a little squatty in that position, which is totally fine because he is a football athlete. Um, I don't mind him right there. He's looking really good. He's still getting that knee drive and he's applying force downwards into the ground. And he's not crossing those arms over like a regular soccer football player. He's bringing them out in front of himself and pulling. 
So shortest ground contact time, greatest hip height at this point. And this is the highest hamstring involvement. So if you do have athletes that have hamstring issues, I would go with short, short sprints because the longer you sprint, the more you start to come up and the more you involve the hamstring. So for my athletes that are coming back from um, hamstring injury, I actually just do short, short sprints to begin with. So we don't keep aggravating that hamstring. They can still work on their fast switch fibers, which is what I want to achieve without stressing out that ham uh, hamstring. Okay, be the hashtag one more time with our vertical emphasis. You can take some videos of your athletes and you can show them, are you in that nice position where you're creating these lines? And when I say creating these lines, th this is like the perfect amount of form. Your athletes don't have to hit exactly this. Every athlete is different and we can get as close as possible. That's what you wanna achieve with these athletes. So why train maximal velocity? You're like, we play football, we're not running that far sometimes, but many team sports rarely hit their true maximal velocity, but game-changing plays often depend on top speed. Uh, you kind of see DK Metcalf chasing down Buda Baker here. He went 22 miles per hour, so I got um, some next-gen stats here of the speed of some of these football athletes, and you can see they're pretty speedy. So when it comes up to maximal velocity speed and a game changing play, they will need to train that top speed because they will get up there, right? So that's one of the reasons that I do train uh, maximal velocity and top speed with these athletes. All right, so upright mechanics may begin as early as 20 yards. And I love showing this because um, Ken Clark actually did um, a little testing at the NFL combine, I believe in 2018 or 2019. He took all the maximal velocity profiles of the bigs and littles and uh, athletes and put them together from their 40 yard dash. And this was his findings is that he found that all of the athletes, regardless of size, hit their peak 86, um, 89 to 96% of the athletes actually hit their maximal velocity at 20 meters or 20 yards here, which is really interesting because track, like professional track and field athletes actually hit it a little bit later on. But for these NFL athletes, they're going to hit it around 20 meters. So that shows us that we don't even need to really um, make them run a whole bunch of 100 meters or 40s. If you are in a season, we can get away with doing just a couple 20 yard dashes because they're gonna hit their maximum velocity and their top end speed right away without putting a lot of stress on their central nervous system. So I thought that that was really interesting to show you guys is we're kind of doing away with um, doing a lot of the cardio where we're making them run wind sprints for 300 meters. We can actually just do a few maximal 20s or 30s, which would be really good because those athletes will be hitting those top end speeds um, within that distance. So maximal velocity drills, here's one of my favorite ones because it actually helps your athletes open up their stride length and frequency. And I know we're always talking about our fast feet drills, fast feet drills. We got a lot of those ladder drills and I will touch on that a little bit, but we are looking beyond that. There's not, um, I just don't find a lot of emphasis on the ladder drills to help you with speed overall. But if we can challenge those hip flexors and extensors, we can actually open up our stride and become faster overall and our brain can rewrite it in that way. So this is actually gonna make us faster. So I give us a little bit of lead up here and I make those cones about two, two meters apart because that's the average stride length for um, a female. You can make it a little bit bigger for a male. So multiple cone drill, I get in my two point start, I'm pushing out and I'm getting one foot. As you can see, I'm nice and high here. I'm up on that foot, not on my toes, which I will talk about. Um, we don't want our athlete running on our toes. I have good hip height. I have good foot height. I'm getting those arms 90, 90, and I'm putting energy into that ground and I'm popping up. So that's gonna help with one of your maximal velocity drills. So agility training for field, uh, field sport athletes. Now, I think this is super important. Some of the drills I put together, you can certainly do way more, but here are some of the best ones that I thought um, I'd present to you today. So backpedaling to a sprint, right? So for some of our agility, I'm gonna talk about which athletes would need this. Lateral progression. So all the athletes are gonna need just a little bit of lateral work just keeping those hips low and going through all of our little lateral drills here. So I do this with tons of positions of my athletes and I'll talk about the different positions and who would benefit from it. 
but these are some of the great ones for field sport athletes. And we can go through these drills, the snake, the ladder snake backwards as well, just to work on those quick hips and movement. Rounded running drills. So this is super, super important. And when people say, what can I do for fast feet? I rather you guys do rounded running drills because that's gonna be in real time, right? We have to turn up field and we have to run around. I get, I get lots of my athletes to do this one and I'll explain um, all the positions that could benefit from it. So single leg lateral hop, we have to do power from our single leg because we wanna work on some of that single leg work here and see how I'm taking off with that arm drive, knee drive, and I'm working on that balanced position there. Because sometimes in a game, we were gonna, we're gonna land on one side and we have to push off the other side. Okay, so med ball training for our field sport athletes. At the end of our training and our sprint stuff, we can actually incorporate some med ball stuff to get a little bit more explosiveness. And I think this is huge for the athletes as well. So I have a little rotational med ball throw here. As you can see, I'm exploding through those hips and just rotating, which is perfect um, for these field sport athletes, bringing to the side slow and exploding through the hips. Now, when I'm doing my kneeling rotation med ball toss, um, I like this because it's isolating my trunk and my core here. And I'm not, I can't use too much of my legs because I'm, as an Olympic uh, lifting athlete, I use a lot of my legs for my explosive movements. So it's isolating my trunk and core here. All right, so our above head med ball toss, why I love this? It's just above our head. And when, as we flick it here, it's gonna be equivalent to doing a whole bunch of sit-ups. I never make my athletes do sit-ups. We do stuff like this that's gonna manipulate our trunk or core a lot better than doing sit-ups because those are all, those are out now. People aren't doing those anymore. So I just do, for those I would do one set of 10 at the end of training. And then I would do overhead med ball throws. So um, a lot of coaches ask me about Olympic lifting for athletes and I compete in the sport. So I might have a bias. So I think it's amazing. But another way you can actually do the Olympic lifting movements with your athletes is doing med ball throws because we are having the ball in our hand and it's going to manipulate that triple extension you will get from doing a snatch or clean and jerk. And we can actually keep the ball in line close, close, close to our body and get that leg explosion, our glute explosion, everything we need to manipulate that uh, velocity that we would get in Olympic lifting, but not as crucial and it's not gonna be as heavy on our joints as Olympic lifting. So we'll do our backward heaves. We could do two sets of eight for that at the end of training. You could have someone throwing you back the ball and our forward one, right? because I'm not hinging at the hips, I'm coming all the way down like I'm expressing a power clean. I'm bringing it up and for height. You can do it for height or you can for, do it from for distance. So stagger, staggered med ball throw press. I'm pressing it out. I'm giving myself a little triple extension here too as I'm popping out here, exploding at those hips and those arms working on that get off, couple steps out. So hopefully this gives you guys more ideas to kind of put with your athletes and seated med ball chest press. So just throw in that med ball to your partner. The last one is a little plyometric um, activity. Hop to med ball throw. So we're gonna hop. I give myself a couple hops and it's gonna work on that um, just like quick, quick steps movements without doing anything like speed ladder. Okay, so how to increase our speed overall. So there's a few ways we can actually manipulate our brain because if we keep running the same speed, um, our brain will just record that and we won't get any faster. So we actually have to challenge ourselves in various ways to get a little faster through flying sprints to help uh, develop that top end speed and in and outs. And I'll talk about the in and outs because it's gonna challenge us, like I said, hip flexors and extensors to increase that limb range and get ourselves a little bit faster. So let's go in and outs first. So with in and outs, um, we're gonna have little segments here and you guys can do this uh, ten, five yards, five yards, five yards, five yards, or 10 yards, depending on what athlete you're training in that day. So we're gonna sprint hard, maintain or float, sprint hard, maintain or float to the end. So our first one is our flying sprint I have demoed here. So you can see I'm, I'm going off into almost 70% um, of my maximal efforts. As soon as I hit this cone here, I'm going 100% from there to the end. So that's more of a soft start as well. And that's gonna challenge my body to get faster by just starting out in a slower position here. And as soon as I hit this, I'm on very hard. And then when we look at our in and outs, 
I'm sprinting, sprinting, sprinting hard here. I'm maintaining, sprinting hard, and then I'm maintaining here. So those are two very great exercises to incorporate with your athletes that are going to overwrite their brain. And you can, you can kind of put that into your training um, once a week, if you would like, or uh, once every couple of weeks to help kind of get over plateaus where we see people um, struggling to get over there. So you're like saying, how do we turn our athletes to sport? Uh, this is an example of sprint volume for different positions. So if we look at football linemen, in our week one, we could do five times 10 meters or yards, whatever you guys are using, five times 10 meters, five times 10 meters. And you can see I gave them around 150 uh, meters of work. So when I train my athletes, I actually count like the meters that we're running and I add that up in volume because it's super, super important when we are first starting out, when you guys bring your guys um, return to play, please keep that in mind is how much volume are we putting into their bodies right now? Because they are they ready to get back into it this is going to be a prevention of injury by slowly ramping it up and you can see by by week four we ramped it up to 200 meters so after that we'll keep ramping it up and keep ramping it up so if you guys go two times per week we have here you can ramp it up to 300 meters and 400 meters if you got if you guys are able to see your athletes three times per week you can get a little bit more volume in there um our linebackers and running backs Week one, uh, for example, we got 10s and 15 meters. And then by week four, we got 10s, 20s, and 30 meters. It, for our quarterbacks, it kind of depends. Like I would sometimes put them in the shorter group. They're not running really far, guys, but it depends what their goals are. Maybe if they are training for a 40, I'll make them run a little bit farther. But if they're not going too far, it depends what kind of quarterback they are. Uh, we'll go a little shorter speed. And then over here, we have our receivers, um, DBs. I'll put the, them in that group as well and special team players. So week one, we're going 10, 15, 20 with these guys, and we're going even farther in week four, 20, 30, and 40. So as you guys can see, we'll ramp it up as we go. And then I wanted to show you kind of like the sprint volume spectrum for sports and positions. And I even have different sports on here so you can kind of see where your athlete lies, um, right? Because our linemen, they require a lot less distance and volume because uh, they are bigger guys or, or girls. So not all sprints are created equal. So central nervous system stress, um, the farther we run, so if we run around 50, uh, 50 meters there, high CNS stress, low CNS stress on the 10 meters. So for example, if I was bringing my athletes, say they have a game on Saturday, I actually will bring them in Friday and we'll do a couple tens and twenties just to get their central nervous system firing, but we're not gonna put a whole bunch of stress on that system and like get them all stressed out, but they need a little bit of sprinting to get them firing. And I've seen greater results on return um, from doing just the tens and twenties than getting them really gassed out and, and maybe doing a walkthrough for them. That's been huge for me. So. so speed drills for football linemen. So here's some drills that I, I'm demoing a lot of these drills. So if I don't look like a lineman, I played corner and running back. So I might butcher it, but here we go. Okay, so we got the offensive lineman drill, getting into our three point stance, right? Rounded running. So these are just like a few more that I would include for just that positional stuff. Like you guys are gonna work on your positional stuff um, as well, but here's a couple of sprint ones that you can do out of that position. We can sprint, do a little crossover. So I got my athlete doing a little crossover here into rounded running, right? And with my lineman, we do like five or 10 yards for this one. We're coming back and we are sprinting right through there. So I like this one because we can go either way here. I give them a little drop and around the cone, change of direction, sprint up. Also here, they can get in their three, uh, oh, they can get in their three point stance here and we're exploding around. You guys you can either do bag drills or exploding around the mini hurdles there or cones. This is in fast motion here. Here we go. Again, I like to get a little um, kind of a rush of my hands in there. I say fast hands, fast hands. So I kind of make them go through that fast hand motion. Also, we can do it from here. I make them cross over and we're getting a little sprint out to the side. Oh my goodness, there we go. I don't know why it's doing that today. Okay, so we're starting here. 
starting here and we are sprinting right through and sprinting to the other side. So same thing and taking off the other direction. Um, for my tight ends, I actually like this drill because we're exploding out, right? I'm exploding out, I'm getting that foot out. Just quick feet, quick feet. I just like to have that little pole at 45 degree angle. Um, quick feet coming out, boom, boom, boom. One foot is coming outside of that pole, the other foot's coming inside and just like pausing right there. So this is another quick feet one. As me as the coach, I'm saying go. And my athlete is just doing back and over the line here. And then I say go again, and they take off in a sprint. So that's another quick feet drill that you guys can do just to get them excited and warmed up for um, the sprinting day. So I'm gonna reiterate this drill because I also think it's really good for defensive linemen as well, is that crossover and that rounded running. Like I said, it's really good for these athletes to do that rounded running. These guys, I gave them the same drill as the linemen, but I also gave them a little different one here. So we're getting a little bit more athletic, turning around, giving a little curl there. I'll let you watch that one again. Coming around that cone, nice low hips. Okay, and uh, these guys are a little bit more um, athletic. So we're having a little more linear run and plant and coming over the middle. That one's such a good one for change of direction. Okay, and then we got it to the side, a little linear run, getting those knees up. This is one of my athletes here. This is one of my defensive linemen that's actually doing one of the falling drills here. And we were working on this just to challenge his core and trunk position a little bit more. And he's got a big, big explosive drive right there. So we've been working on that one for a bit with him. And also I needed to challenge his um, ankles and, and shin mobility. So I made him do a kneeling start, but we actually raised it up quite a bit because he wasn't ready to get fully down on the ground. And you guys can use this as well. So he's coming up just a little bit, a little raised, and he's taken off there. And you can see he's got that explosive arm drive and we're working on being more explosive and working on that get off with him. And he's done such a good job. I'm also working on with them um, doing three consecutive broad jumps in a row. So I actually measure my athletes broad jumps three in a row um, baseline when I first start training with them. And every week I actually touch on this again and depending on where their numbers are at, if they're below what they're used to jumping, we actually adjust training because their central nervous system is fatigued. So that's one of the biggest ways to show me that we need to adjust training. If it's above, I actually add more volume. So that's one of the best ways to figure that out for your athletes. We have uh, running back and linebacker drills. So running back, fast feet, right? Getting those fast feet, fast feet into explosion and ball security and having the ball up there. And I just explode out. So that's, you guys can make it a little bit longer than that. So uh, this is my up and over series. So you can see it's five yards up, five yards across, five yards up, up and over. I'm getting a little shuffle in and explode. There's a different variations for this. So I'll show you all the variations. I'm back pedaling and switching those hips and I'm up. And you guys can use this with your athletes. This one is my little rounded running ones. And my next one's gonna be my hard cuts one, my little hard cuts here, there we go. Okay, we got um, our zigzag series here. Little hard cuts to begin with here, just change of direction. So you guys can make these five yards, five yards. I do this one, this is great for breaking down, right? So I'm running hard, breaking down, using those arms and switching. And you can even for that breakdown one, I'll even command my athlete to stop. I'll say, stop, go, stop, go. Okay, this one's my crossover one. So I'm looking forward the entire way I'm actually looking forward the entire way and I'm crossing over. So that's gonna be um, a great way. And you can even cross over and stop with your athletes. You can say, go, stop, go, stop. All right, so plyometrics too. Uh, we're jumping up and even stopping and breaking down. Jumping and exploding from that falling position because that's gonna be huge too, especially for our ankles um, and mobility. Okay, this is one of my um, linebacker high school athletes. So this is one of my um, up and over drills as well. So we're just going up and then we're falling back, right? We're just challenging his hip flexors, staying low as much as he can. A little series right there and you guys can make that as long. I would keep it, keep it short because it's, it's quite tasking for the athletes and my linebackers. Um, 
we also have another drill here. This one's a W drill. As you can see right there, it looks like a little mini W. So I actually start them from backpedaling to switching and exploding through, backpedaling and switching and exploding through. With more space, you guys can make it farther out. I just have, didn't have a lot of space for this one. All right. So uh, receivers, let's look at some receivers, DBs and special teams drills. Okay, I'm gonna add this one back in because it's super important, right, for our DBs to drop back and run through there. So this one as well, I really wanna have this one for our receivers and DBs because we are backpedaling, right? So we're coming up, I just put that one back in just to show that it can be used for another position as well. All right, for our DBs, of course, switching those hips. And when, when I do this, I'm usually like the coach there that's standing right there that's saying switch, 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 or I'm moving the ball back and forth. And then we run out of this position. So switch it all the way around and I'm exploding through. So again, W drill for all these positions as well is really important because we get that little back pedal and explosive movement in there. So receivers, right? We're um, changing positions change in direction and exploding through. So that's gonna work through the change of direction exploding. And these are gonna be really good for that is those lying ones. You guys can do a clap start from this one. You can say go, they're changing that direction and going. And it's gonna be less stress on your uh, central nervous system. And then our bounding starts. So we're gonna get our athletes to get into our uh, two point start, switching that shin down I'm exploding out through that and I am bounding. So I'm putting more pressure onto the ground where I'm exaggerating my arm drive and knee drive to almost pop off the ground. And you can see it's super fast and super explosive. And I love doing these bounding drills with these athletes. Um, we'll watch that bounding one just one more time in real time here because it's gonna increase their stride length and frequency, I'm getting that toe up. Okay, quarterbacks. I wanna put this one back in because quarterbacks, we're gonna to have to drop back a little bit. So I give this to the quarterbacks I have as well. Ah, uh, this one. So I'm gonna get my quarterback to drop back three steps, uh, five steps, whatever you guys wanna do. I did a couple steps here and then I ran right through. I did my best quarterback impression. So rounded running. So I get my quarterbacks. I even as a coach, like I say go and then I put the pressure on them. Like I follow my athlete into this run, rounded running. I follow them. So I'll pretend like I'm putting a little pressure on them. This one, we're because we want to have not always bigger stride lengths for our quarterbacks, but little, little tiny steps and right through, and you can sprint right through. This is just an example, right? So that's another way you guys can do fast feet stuff. And it's not just using um, a complete ladder. So now we did all this work. I talked, I talked your ear off about the work. Let's talk about cool downs because it's super, super important. Sometimes we just let our athletes leave. No, let's do a little cool down. And this one's super important for our knees and joints and everything going on. So what I'm doing is I'm just putting my foot down and I'm raising my heel because I, I feel like way too much these athletes, they're putting in so much volume and you guys are returning to play. This is going to be great for injury prevention is um, not stressing out those calves, hamstrings, knees, Achilles. This is going to be great for that. So this one, I'm just walking on my toes sideways. And I want you guys to do two times these things. I'm only going through it once in this demo video, but even go two rounds there and back. I'd rather you guys go around 10 yards. So this one, I'm just going backwards, just side to side. And this one's for hamstrings as well. And it's not greatly intense. I'm just cooling down. I'm getting my athletes. I take off my shoes because it's really good for proprioception. So on the feet, this is one of my athletes after our workout. Um, I'm just getting him to cool down and work on that proprioception on the feet again. So he's just doing light bunny hops or rudiments as some people do call them for around 10 yards here. And he's getting that height and he's cooling down the body by just working on little tiny hops here. And I love this because it really brings them back to center. We're, we're bringing that nervous system back down to the grounded level. We sprinted really fast. And um, we're giving that, those feet some love because we really destroyed those feet with sprinting. Side to side, such a good one. Side to side. And that's, I would um, do these all at the end. As you can see, if the athlete's kind of struggling through them, which he might be at the end here, we kind of shut it down after that, right? And then the last one you can do is just a little single leg stuff. If you have athletes that have bilateral deficits, which is, just means one leg is stronger than the other. 
Um, I really encourage you guys to work on that single leg stuff because it's going to be huge, especially return to injury. And you front words, front words sideways. And I believe the next one is uh, backwards. Mm. Oh, that's all I had actually. So those are really good ones. You guys can do single leg, double leg of those rudiments and hops. And that's going to be huge for cool downs and getting your athletes return to play. Um, and this is an example of a training, what a training week would look like with your sprinting stuff. So on a high day, might be a Monday, you can do sprinting. I would live, I would leave like a little break there and do a little bit of agility, not do it just, just back to back. So you can get like a really for, uh, good 45 minute to an hour sprinting session in a little bit of agility later, maybe your lifting session. It doesn't have to be Olympic lifting, but this is kind of a table I found on the internet um, that kind of showed Derek Hansen's high low training week for American football players, which is really, really good. Cause this is how I volu um, program for my athletes. We do a high, we do a low day, which is our tempo day. And when we go into our aerobic capacity work, um, it's going to be a little bit of longer running around 50%. So I'll make my athletes do like, um, five forties at 50% of their maximal effort, right. On that lower day. So they can kind of get that stride length frequency and work on form and function. And it's going to turn that CNS to normal. Okay. What cues should I use if I'm watching these athletes? So when we're working on that acceleration phase, tell them to push down and back explode. Once your thigh gets to the top, our legs need to be scissors, right? If we're coming up with our leg, we need to explode down with the same one. I've seen some people be off on that. So that's a good one to say. Hit your calf to your hamstring, as I showed you guys previously. Drop your shoulders, relax, relax. Oh my gosh, way too many athletes. They're, they're just so stressed up here on the shoulders. They're limiting their range of motion. They got small T-Rex arms. Just relax, open up that arm and you'll open up your range of motion. The arms work, your legs are gonna open up too. Get up for maximal velocity. Um, you don't have to be completely 100% um, like a sprinter. Cause I know these are football athletes, but get up there, work on that top end speed. Cues not to say, don't tell your athletes to stay low because off, off, like they often hinge at the hip and I don't like saying low, I say, get that angle, lean. Get that angle because then that, that shows them that they need more um, straighter back and form and function for that. Should feel like you're falling. It shouldn't always feel like you're falling and you're trying to catch up with your body. You, sh you should be having a little bit of control with that trunk. Um, keep arms at 90 degrees the whole time. You don't have to, right? Because these are football athletes. Um, if it kind of breaks for a little bit, don't worry about it. As long as we're working on that form and function, function when we're doing um, those skipping A drills, that's what I like to see. And that's when I implement that the most. Cast a foot out and pull the ground. I hear that with way too many parents. We are not casting a foot out and pulling the ground at all. We're actually just bringing that leg up and putting it right underneath back our hips and coming over our body. Um, sprint on your toes. That's another great one that I hear uh, people say, and do not sprint on your toes. You're going to mess up your feet in the long run. So we're going to touch, um, when we are sprinting, I'll show you right here on my shoe. We're just going to hit our foot right here on the bottom here with our little heel up. That's where we're going to strike. We're going to strike on the surface for sprinting, not on our toes. So get a high turnover. Um, we are just going to don't get that knee way too high. Right. Cause then I see tons of athletes having a weaker core or trunk because of it. And that's going to make them um, weaker overall and uh, create some injuries. Awesome. So I'm Amanda Ruler and I hope you guys had a really good time listening to my presentation. Um, so just remember when cheetahs run super, super fast, it actually takes them a whole 48 hours to recover. And um, that's my science fact. That's my science fact of the day. And they are the fastest animal alive. So let's treat our athletes like cheetahs and to give them good recovery rest after they have sprinted really, really fast. <laughs> Great job, Amanda. <laughs> was that uh, was that last cheetah quote? Because uh, somebody at the combine a couple of years ago says, I've never seen a cheetah stretch. Is that, uh, is that what you're- Yes, uh... <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, 100%. Any, uh, any questions from anybody? I've got about four or five here myself, but I'll let uh, let some of the others. Sure, I'll others. yeah Go answer ahead. them to the best of my ability. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? You go first. Right. I get them too, so go for it. Um, 
So one of the first ones, when should, uh, when should we be doing this with our athletes? Like so, some of that stuff, and I guess kind of comes back to one of the last pictures you just showed us about the, um, the example of the training week. Like obviously in Ontario, we're getting right now, I think we're going to probably be able to go, we'll say maybe an hour with about 10 athletes. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's not, that's not very, that's a lot of athletes or sorry, that's a few number of athletes for a long time, as you just said, right? Like sometimes as coaches will run them for the full 60 minutes and wear them out. Right. So um, when should we start with some of that stuff that you showed us? I think it's, uh, it's super important to start it now, especially with that low volume. And if you, if you guys don't have to go for 45, like 45 to 60 minutes, put in the quality work here. I hate that um, sometimes coaches put in filler activities, get in that quality sprint work. And I actually have a little example here. Um, If someone had asked about it, I'm just going to share my screen one more time of what that might look like. So here's an example of what you can do. So you can even do a little form and function. So if you're just starting out, you can do the two times 10 meters, that marching eight. Like this is just if you see your athletes once or twice a week. So you can do your speed week, um, speed day, sorry, and then your tempo day the next day. So you got explosive push up start. Start with that. Start working and making those foundations. So that's why I put explosive push up starts first because it's going to work on our trunk and core and positioning. Then we go into our falling starts. And I don't even put in three point starts or two point starts here because um, we're working on just getting that, um, getting some of that baseline stuff in here. And I only have 20 meters for four reps. Like we just want to get in a little bit of work now so that our volume um, is, isn't overloading their system. So I would, I would start with just once a week and then it has to be 45 minutes. Don't add a whole bunch of agility with them right now. So just do some soft starts to introduce them, do a really big warm up as I have here, form and function, second place here. And then you guys can add some med ball stuff in there. There you go, Rick. You got two practice plans already done. Right. There we go. Yeah. Sorry. And then the next day we, we do have a little bit lower tempo day. So I would do our high sprint day, a low tempo tempo day to get them um, even buffering like that lactic acid and metabolic waste that we kind of put up for that first day because they will be sore. They will be sore. So the next day we can even do 50 meters times four. Um, this was for some of my um, athletes that run a little farther. So you can even do like 30 meters times four a three minute break because uh, we want them to rest and recover. So it takes three whole minutes for our uh, phosphocreatine system to recharge and our ATP system to get back to normal. That's why I say three whole minutes. Charbs, you go ahead and ask your question. I got a couple more. All right, perfect. Well, um, one, I really like the the chip visual because a lot of guys (laughs) have a habit of, you know, clenching that thumb into that index finger so hard, you know, so like, hard. like the, the white in the, in the thumbnail. So I like that, that they're, you know, just that visual don't crush the chip. That's great stuff. And the, be the hashtag is everything is hashtag everything. So it's an easy <laughs> visual for them to get. So um, when you're doing the in and outs, what was the distance between those uh, the different velocities? Yeah, it could be like if you have your linemen, like I would just do five yards, five yards, five yards, five yards. And if you do, um, say, maybe your receivers, um, it could be even farther. So I would do 10, 10, 10, 10. And if you want to go wild, you can do um, 15, 15, 15. But I wouldn't go past 15, 15 times four. So I don't go um, crazy. Into, I don't do 20s, 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 because I used to do that for track and field myself. But I was running the 100 meter. So these guys that are running short, just go fives. Um, or 10s and then 15s. Nice. Nice. Yeah, so we had um, the college that I was at, uh, we did spring ball in the fall and like all the stuff that you were just showing, that's what we did for the first, I don't know how many practices just to get them back into it, right? Because they've Mm -hmm. been sitting around for so long and just getting their bodies ready for getting back into football. So getting their soft tissue, you know, used to running again, instead of just sitting on a couch and playing, I don't know what video game they're playing these days, but you know, so that's all, that's awesome stuff that you just gave there. So. Mm-hmm. Rick, you got the next question. So for high school athletes, you talked about the, like you, one of your very first clips, you showed us the warm up. How far should that 
sort of, I think you did basically your arm circles and, and sort of the, the skipping. How, how far is that? Like, how far should I be sending my guys? 15 meters. So I usually make my guys do 15 meters. I found um, if it's 20, especially for football athletes, especially 20 is too far. If I'm a track and field athlete, like when I did track and field, I did around 25, but that's because my warmups lasted almost 30 minutes for the stuff I was doing. The football athletes, I'm going to make it 15 minutes. And that's even longer than I've seen. Like I even played football and our warmups like um, were like five minutes and I, and it wasn't dynamic. It was like very um, static stretching. So let's do 15 minutes for 15 yards of this dynamic, non-static warm-up. Nice. Uh, how, mu how much does that medicine ball weigh that you were working with? And does it depend on athletic, like the athletes? Yeah, exactly. So for a lot of my athletes, I use just 10 pounds because we don't want to like put a lot of pressure on their CNS and they should be able to throw that med ball with perfect form. So I found like 10 pounds, 12 pounds for my guys is the sweet spot. So if I have um, girls, I actually do like five or six pound med ball just because just they're just a little bit different body type. Um, but for my guys, I do 10 to 12. And then if you saw my really, really big lineman guys there, we actually do 14. So I do have a 14 pound med ball there. I won't go anything bigger because they say they can do it. Cause they'll always be like, no, I, I want to be tough. This isn't about toughness. It's about form and function. So it just, just putting a little bit of like uh, manipulation on the arms and using that med ball, it's going to be a little bit lighter. So I would stick in the range, like 10 to 14. Yeah, they're definitely a great investment for any team. Just yeah. you, can, you can use them for drills, like even going through regular drills um, for football, you can use them and then use them at the end of practice, do a bunch of stuff like you had going and at the beginning of practice and stuff. So yeah, endless a versatile uh, thing to buy. So it's a good purchase. Tell us a little bit about the Legends Football League. I, I like I know I've kind of looked through some of your videos and stuff that you've got up there and mm. it's pretty aggressive and like it's tell us about it. Yeah, so um, when I first wanted to play football, there wasn't in 2012, there wasn't any football here. So I ventured out to the States and I joined the Legends Football League and it was on TV at the time, um, like the Oprah Network, which was really, really cool because it was a platform for women to go out and play football. It was full on tackle football in the States. It was arena style. So we played in arenas. It was 7v7, which was really, really cool. Um, I was on the LA Temptations and then I played for the Atlanta Steam. That was a really fun experience. It was really cool to be with these women from different states and being able to, for me to travel around the states and play. Um, it was a paid league at the time, but they don't pay the women anymore. So I came over and started playing in Canada for women's team, uh, Canada Women's Football. So the Legends Football League, it was, it was formerly when it first started in 20, uh, 2008, the Lingerie Football League. So they fully adapted from there um, and you wore a sports bra and kind of like shorts. But when I competed in track and field, that was what I wore to sprint. So for me, that was huge because I was like, I'm, I'm good. I'm a running back. Like this is what I've worn before. So it was amazing to even work with these confident um, women that wanted to play football. So we would practice quite a bit and um, showcase our talents all over this California at the time and then Atlanta. So that was so much fun to do. And I'm glad I was part of it. And then I transitioned to Team Canada football. You know, you saw the picture fully clothed and everything. And it was really, really fun to do both. And then when I had more padding for Team Canada, I was like, this is awesome. People can tackle me all they want. I'm not, I'm not feeling it now because I played uh, a little less padding in the Legends League. So it was hard nosed football. <laughs> Sorry, what was the Canadian League you just mentioned? Um, so uh, the Canadian Women's Worlds Football. So I was on Team Canada for uh, women, just like the U.S. Uh, we played again together. For the um, we for Team Canada, they actually had tryouts in different provinces, and I attended one of the tryouts in Saskatchewan here in I think 2016, the December of 2016, because it was being played in the summer in BC. 
So um, we ended up going to BC as a team because they pick people from different provinces and we could practice together. So we went to BC and then had like that full couple weeks of practice. And then we ended up playing in the tournament um, against USA and other people like that in Great Britain. And um, we came second. And did you, did you have to fundraise for that? How did that work? That yes, um, which is uh, interesting because we were mentioned. You guys were mentioning fundraising, so I had to pay out of pocket, like to play, which is like, like almost like two, I think it was like almost three thousand dollars, like for me to play in that one tournament, and it like paid for flights and food and stuff. Um, but it's too bad that like stuff wasn't funded for women to just go play. And I'm not sure about the men's side because I didn't do any research about if they had to fundraise that much. But at the time, like I did personal fundraising, like they didn't give us a platform. And fortunate enough, I had a lot of um, interest on my social media. So I exchanged like personal training programs and stuff for fundraising. So that's what I did uh, because they weren't, they didn't kind of help us with that. And I will say that, that they kind of left us on our own and that I did on my own. I raised all of my money. So, but that was a pretty penny to, to pay to just go play in this tournament for Team Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's so tough. Well, for for Canada, you know, you're either going to choose to do it all from part of Ontario. You know, they might just do the team just from part of Ontario. But if you go for the entire country, people are going to have to include the flights. And, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're lucky, you might be able to get some, uh, some of the players to billet other players when they come in and stuff. But there's a lot of costs associated. So... And you got to take out, take time off of work. So that's yeah. the crazy thing too. So not an easy deal. No, <laughs> but I was an honor. I just want to say it was an honor for me to play for my country at that level. So it was awesome. Yeah, it's pretty neat. And Amanda, what's, um, what's your plans right now? I know like I followed a little bit uh, of sort of you'd like to, you were with the Regina Rams, is that correct? The football team you helped coach? Yeah, yeah. So I was helping coach um, speed, sprint training, agility with them up until the pandemic and then had to call it quits. So I was working with them individually because I was with the university. Um, I was working with them individually. So hopefully maybe getting back with a university or I'm working with Hub City Football um, in July here, July 18th. They are doing uh, kind of an NFL combine camp for athletes that haven't been drafted. And I'm going to go down there. It's in uh, San Diego and I'm running warm ups and cool downs and I'm working with the DBs. So that's something I'm working towards and maybe getting um, some looks from coaches myself because I really, really, really want to press more women into um, coaching in the CFL level. And I know like, I'm not saying just me, any woman just um, want to get an audition, um, an interview, and maybe make that happen for the future women in that sport, because I don't see a lot of representation. So that's something I wish um, for more internships at that level. And I'm just applying and I'm putting myself out there as much as I can doing stuff like this, um, being on that Sports Illustrated NFL Draft Bible talking about um, women in sports. We got cool women here that are representing women in football and I, I love it. I'm gonna keep pressing for that kind of stuff and doing volunteering for all the coaching opportunities I can get. Mm -hmm.